Aloha, I'm Keisha King, and you're watching At The Crossroads. I was a successful business executive and human resources director for 15 years. I've been an educator teaching 12 years in the mainland, Japan, China, and now right here in Hawaii. As a former Teacher of the Year, I have collaborated with families, educators, politicians, and community stakeholders to develop moral and inclusive citizens, create critical thinkers, pre preparation for work for workforce, enhance independent living for all learners. My special guest today is Dr. Sunny Pai. She is a digital initiatives librarian at University of Hawaii's Kapiolani Community College. She has degrees from Brandeis University, Massachusetts, University of Southern California, and her PhD from University of Hawaii at Manoa. Thank you for being here, Dr. Pai. Oh, please, you can just call me Sunny. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for being here, Sunny. It is my pleasure to have you. So I want to jump right into our discussion for today. As you know, the cost of college education has increased over the decades, oh, just astronomically. And we have students now who are paying a huge amount of money for student loans. And that is not simply covering tuition, room, and board. There are other expenses that our students have to pay. Why don't you talk to us about textbooks? Okay. Well, um, textbooks have been a significant cost for um, students, uh, both K-12 and in higher education. And um, since the 1970s, um, textbooks, the cost of textbooks has a much higher inflation rate than anything else that's been measured. Um, from the um, Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, um, there's, um, it shows that the inflationary rate of textbooks has been over a thousand percent from right uh, the 1970s up to, okay. A thousand percent. That's not a hundred percent. That's not even 500%. No. That is 1000% increase in the cost of textbooks. Can you tell me what Correct. that looks like in dollars and cents? For the average book. Well, you're right. Well, these, I mean, like a few years ago, um, I was uh, doing a workshop and one of our faculty members who's sending her students um, to school um, was saying that at Hawaii Community College, um, the, the cost of a textbook was up to $400. And this was already a couple of years ago. So we're way over the $400 mark for, um, you know, uh, textbooks that aren't necessarily law books or highly specialized books. I see. Well, that's incredible that it has increased by that much. Um, I understand that this is affecting students because of the cost, but you initially said that 55% of students were not buying textbooks. Can you talk to me about that? And where did that okay. statistic come from? All right, that's um, that's a statistic that was um, drawn from a uh, student survey that Leeward Community College did um, a, a couple of years ago. They were modeling their survey after a nationwide survey um, put together by the uh, U, uh, U.S. Uh, Public Information Research Group um, that was showing that actually 65% of the students across the country were not uh, purchasing their textbooks. Fortunately for Leeward, it was uh, it was a little bit lower, but you can imagine um, what a significant disadvantage that is if students are not getting access to their learning materials right away or even at all. And this is these are students who acknowledge that they need the books in order to do well in the class, mm -hmm. but they simply can't afford it. So they find other ways to get around it, or they just try to get through the class. So I've spoken with some. Go ahead. Go ahead. I've spoken with some faculty who've who've come up to me and they've said, "I've always wondered why." At the beginning of the semester, students come to me and ask me if they really need to buy the textbook. And the faculty member said, now I understand better what's going on. Yeah, you know, I think sometimes educators are a little bit detached from the actual cost 
that students have to pay. So it's unfortunate mm -hmm. that they didn't know that prior to that. Um, so you're yes. saying that 52% of the students felt textbook costs affected whether or not they would actually stay in school. Right, yes. That's so that's, right, yeah, that's, that's directly related to um, student success, as we say here in the higher education field. Um, the University of Hawaii is, has made a really strong commitment to try and get students to their certificates and degrees. They want to increase the rate of graduation as much as possible. Uh, you can see it in our strategic plans. Um, so if students are, you know, really having a difficult time affording their textbooks, that's, that's really a problem. And yeah. um, textbook what about affordability. Financial aid? What about okay. financial aid? Yes. Doesn't that help? Yes, financial aid, um, financial aid helps in many ways. Um, the irony that I find with financial aid, um, first of all, students have said to me that um, um, it takes the, the ability to purchase textbooks with financial aid sometimes kicks in like one or two weeks or maybe even three weeks before they can start purchasing their textbooks. I'm not exactly sure what the, what the procedures are, but it seems to be a common problem. And so those students are already uh, one or two weeks behind the ball, and that's a serious loss um, in terms of keeping up with the other students because there's only really 16 weeks to, um, to do your course. Um, exactly. And the other thing that's ironic in my, in my view of things is that the students who can least afford um, expensive textbooks end up relying on loans to be able to pay for those textbooks. Of course, these loans sometimes don't get, or a lot of times, don't get paid off over many years. And if you think about the interest rate, they've actually paid more for that textbook than the person who can pay, the student who can pay up front. So exactly. I think that's, you know, that's an unfortunate irony. I think we would call that an affordability disadvantage. They cannot afford Correct. the books and therefore they suffer in school. And that two week delay Correct. that happens when they are under financial aid can be critical at the beginning of any semester. Absolutely, yeah. Yes. But especially for students who, uh, who might be the first in their family. I'm, I work at a community college, so we're always concerned about that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we have a high percentage, if they're first in their family, they're still getting used to um, functioning in a higher education environment. It's not quite the same as high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so that's, uh, and some of them are married, have kids, are raising a family, they're working part-time. This is, this is a lot of stress for them. Yeah. So now tell us about OER, the Open Educational Resources. What is that? Okay. Well, um, Open Educational Resources, the term uh, first came about, I'm referring to my notes, yeah, <laughs> um, in uh, 2002. <laughs> um, and it was basically um, uh, put forth by uh, United Nations, um, UNESCO. And um, they, they were, they basically put out a Paris Declaration in 2012 where they're where they're encouraging um, countries around the world to really look at reducing the costs of textbooks in order to support developing countries um, and you know, working class and middle class students, uh, helping them to advance in their higher education. So this was a concept that was first coined, uh, again, by the United Nations um, way back in 2002. So the United States has been um, working on this um, um, I became familiar with it in 2014, but they've been working on it for at least a few decades now on the mainland. Um, the concept now, when you, of... When you mention the United Nations, that lets us know that mm -hmm. this is not just a, a United States problem. This is not just a Hawaii problem, but this is a nationwide, worldwide problem. Exactly, right. Mm. And yeah. so uh, what they were calling for was for um, faculty um, and administrators to support them uh, to create um, teaching, learning, and research materials. They could be digital, it could be hard copy um, that are in the, um, 
that are in the public domain or are released under an open license mm -hmm. um, that permits no cost access. So what that means is that um, students have access to free materials um, that have been vetted and created um, by scholars. Um, they encourage, there's a lot of material that goes into public domain because of um, it's either released public domain or it falls into public domain from a copyright status. They encourage um, instructors to use uh, free materials to use as examples for their classes or create an openly license. And by openly licensing, if I, for example, if I make a textbook, if I write a textbook or I do a fantastic learning website, I give permission um, to anybody in the world to use that website, to use those materials so that they mm -hmm. can adapt it for their own students. So another example is, I suppose, I know we have hymns that are very old, centuries old, and they go mm. into the public domain, but that's a hymn. Mm -hmm. What about um, other materials, uh, photographs and things like that? Can you give us an example yes. of those resources? Okay. Well, um, there are, um, there are, uh, there's a ton of photographs um, and um, uh, even, um, uh, you know, films um, that are long out of um, copyright at this point. Mm -hmm. um, they are, um, there are, there are sites where you can go where you can look for these kinds of materials and you can check on the, the licensing. And um, if it's um, out of copyright and it's in public domain, then you're free to use it, especially if it's public domain, then you can also alter it. So you'll see a lot of works um, in open educational resources where uh, works that are out of copyright um, are um, incorporated in learning materials or even altered um, in order to um, uh, support the uh, learning process. Wonderful. Now, are materials created by scholars and available for use? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So these are these are instructors um, at higher ed, um, higher education institutions, two year, four year graduate school, and also I think there's there's a growing movement in the K to twelve um, kindergarten to uh, high school educational community, and they're creating materials and sharing it out and helping their their colleagues. Perfect. So now we have one minute to break and I kind of want to review where we are right now. What we said okay. is that open educational resources are free resources available to students both at, on the college level as well as K-12. Mm -hmm. Yes, there, there are uh, places that you can go to search for materials that have been released for K-12 to also. Okay, wonderful. When we come back from our break, we're going to talk to Dr. Pai, funny, just a little bit more. Uh -huh. We're going to touch bases about open, open educational resources and how we are working with that right here in Hawaii as well as nationwide. You're watching At the Crossroads. Okay. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go beyond the lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just gonna scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons, and then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up, and please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Aloha and welcome back to At the Crossroads. We're discussing open educational resources or OER. We've been chatting with my guest, Dr. Sunny Pai of the University of Hawaii Kapiolani Community College. And Sunny, welcome back. 
Thank you. So now I need to ask you, how did OER come to Hawaii? Okay. Well, um, my understanding is that, um, hey, Okimoto, one of our uh, senior um, academic administrators, um, found out about the movement on the mainland. She's, she's the Associate Vice President for Student Affairs and Director of Academic Technologies. And she arranged for um, Cable Green of Creative Commons to come to the University of Hawaii and do several presentations um, to all the chancellors and administrators here at, throughout the 10 campuses. Um, and um, in 2014, um, Outreach College at Manoa started a position uh, where uh, they, would, they were encouraging the adoption of um, open educational resource practice. And that just kind of spread uh, from there to all the other campuses. I see. And so, so now at this we, point, go ahead. I'm sorry. At this point, um, we have instructional designers and librarians on all the campuses and also um, instructional faculty, the ones who teach. Um, we're all collaborating with each other, kind of a grassroots effort too. Yeah. So it kind of, it kind of came in from administration, but it was quickly adopted at a grassroots level throughout all campuses. I see. And um, they're, um, they're finding the materials that are already out there um, on the web and um, putting it together and um, uh, basically modifying it for their classes and for their students. Wonderful. So now instructors are modifying it for them. Um, it went throughout the university system, but is this just right now for community colleges or can someone get this at UH Manoa? Oh, yes. Um, we have people, we have um, materials at UH Manoa. Okay. Um, if you go to oer.hawaii.edu, you'll, you'll, you'll see some of the materials that are being published mm -hmm. and um, um, each, uh, many of the campuses are already, the community colleges um, are already teaching classes with OER, or okay. we, all, we also call it um, textbook cost zero. There's a slightly different definition to textbook cost zero. Okay. Um, so, um, and also West Oahu is coming on board uh, very quickly. And I think uh, Hilo's coming on board. I'm, I'm referring to the four years, of course. Okay, terrific. That sounds really good. So now with all of that being said, this textbook zero strategy is also known as uh, TXTO. Now, Correct. is that system-wide as well? Yes, that's system-wide. Um, if a student goes to register for classes, um, in, in Banner, um, that's, that's the, um, online, I mean, that's the registration process that uh, where students can sign up for courses. Um, they're going to see um, in the left-hand margin um, a code, TXT0, and what that means is um, for that particular class, you can take that class and not have to pay for a textbook. Um, usually what that means is the faculty member has, other, has either found a wonderful textbook or materials that they can use uh, to teach the course without the students having to pay for it. Or in many cases, the, the faculty member has actually created the materials, mm -hmm. um, which, is, which is tremendous work on their part. And they, they really deserve a lot of credit uh, for the kind of work and dedication they put into that. Now, as an aside, I need to ask you, on the one hand, if they are creating the materials, that's wonderful. But if they are mm -hmm. getting materials that are free and open to the public, mm -hmm. and they may be from many years ago, how well is the education that is, or the information that is being presented, how up to date is that? Um, well, um, if the material um, is, is uh, dated, then of course what they'll do, the beautiful thing about open educational resources is that you can take the material and you can freely update it. Okay. Um, when, the, when the author releases it um, as open, I mean, the author still has copyright over the material, mm -hmm. but the author will say um, through a system of um, 
uh, through a declaration system, uh, which is uh, managed by an organization called Creative Commons, you, uh, you basically are saying you're free to take this material and update it. So a lot of faculty will find, for example, the textbook that was perhaps um, last written 10 years ago, and then they can go and they can, um, they can, um, update the material, they can add chapters that they want to add, they can take mm. out anything that they don't want to have. Um, what, what we also do is we encourage faculty to make it relevant to um, your local context. So uh, we have textbooks that um, have examples uh, that draw from, you know, history or biology or uh, Hawaiian culture to what we call localize it so that the material is more relevant directly to our students here. Okay. So I can imagine that the educators feel as though they have, are having a great effect on students because they allow them the opportunity to afford uh, college because they can uh -huh. afford these resources. And I suppose right. you can tell me a little bit about the effect this is having on the students. All right. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, the students, it, it's a tremendous benefit to the students. I've, I've been to meetings um, at student Congress um, or, you know, student meetings and um, uh, they, they've given such positive feedback at being able to um, afford to um, go to, go to classes. Um, the uh, cost of textbooks can, can run into, run anywhere from 500 to 1,000 or even more dollars a semester. And that's a tremendous burden for them. Yeah. Um, the other advantage for faculty is when they actually work with the content or, I mean, of course they always work with the content, but mm -hmm. when they're altering the content to make it open uh, for their students or they're creating it from scratch, mm -hmm. um, they really get to, um, to customize it for their particular students. So a class, an English uh, 100 class at Leeward Community College, you know, a, a faculty member might have a certain kind of approach. The same class at Kapiolani, uh, the faculty member may choose to have a different kind of approach depending on the students. So um, I love the faculty that member idea. has, I yeah, do. And so they can I really want to show customize. our first image because there mm -hmm. is something happening at Leeward College that I want to mention. And we have okay. that image coming up now. 40% of the classes there are textbook cost zero. And then at Kapiolani College, we have 30% of the instructor, instructors are teaching textbook cost zero classes. So that those are really, really good numbers. That's a really good sign. I wanna ask you, Sunny, what are the immediate future trends for the university? Okay. Um, well, we are, um, uh, West, West Oahu, West Oahu and um, Hilo are coming on board. I mean, they've been, uh, uh, they've been uh, basically starting up for the last year or two, um, uh, more so West Oahu at this point, but I'm sure Hilo, Hilo is uh, right behind. And um, what's happening on so March 6th? That means um, March our 10 6, campuses will be, yeah, March 6th, we're going to have, um, uh, we're having uh, the, um, uh, let's see, the Strategic, um, Hawaii Strategic Institute at, um, at which is going to take place at um, Hilton Hawaiian Village Hotel. Basically, the entire community college system um, is going to gather and they're going to do a system-wide conference um, on um, student success. And okay. so we'll have uh, nationally known speakers, Amanda Coolidge, and Delmar Larson. Uh, they'll be coming to do workshops and presentations on the latest development in uh, OER. I appreciate you so um, much. The... For... Go ahead. I'm okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, I'm sorry. The um, other developments are we're going to be getting, we're generating more textbooks from all campuses. And um, we have what we're called, what we're calling OER sprints, where the University of Hawaii system is um, gathering faculty from multiple campuses to tackle a given subject. Like recently there was an English 100 
Uh, mm -hmm. OER Sprint, uh, there's been an OER Sprint in economics. So the idea is the community colleges and the four years, they get together, they create a textbook that they know is going to work for as many students as possible. That's terrific. So we've covered a lot. We've explained what OER is. We noted that Cable Green came in to UH at 2014, that this is a really grassroots effort that's taking place with the faculty, including librarians and instructional designers such as yourself. And then thanks to the innovation and funding from UHCC system and support from the Outreach College and UH Information Technology Service, almost all of the campuses have developed their own programs. So, that made it possible for a lot of students to attend school with textbook zero cost. Um, and that community colleges have helped save about $5.6 million as of spring 2019. I'm going to show our last image because if you want to find out more information, you can simply visit the newly updated oer.hawaii.edu system wide news, and you can go to openkapiolani.hawaii.edu for news from Kapiolani Community College. Sunny, thank you so much for sharing this information with us today. You are an excellent guest and oh, the subject matter you. expert. Thank you so much. And I look forward to hearing more about how you can and your system can help students save so much money attending college. I think that this really solidifies what we're trying to do here on this show. So once again, thank you, Sunny, and thank you all for watching at the Crossroads. As always, we want to make sure that we are making college and all forms of education affordable to all. We are hoping that you will join us again for our next discussion right here on ThinkTech Hawaii. I have been your host, Keisha King, and I'll see you next time. Aloha.